The National Broadcasting Company presents Radio City Playhouse, Attraction 21. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the author of tonight's play and the director of Radio City Playhouse, Harry W. Junkin. Thank you, Bob Warren. Good evening, everybody. Although this is not by any means her first appearance on our show, we are very happy indeed to welcome Miss Jan Miner back to Radio City Playhouse. It was this talented young actress who opened our series last July 3rd with a sensational performance in a play called Long Distance. So stirring was the impression created by Miss Minor in this play that we repeated it some weeks later. It is, then, with justifiable pride that we welcome her back tonight in response to many, many requests from all across the country. She plays the part of Janet Wood, a role seldom equaled for the depth and intensity of emotion which it requires. Here is Jan Minor in Strange Identity, Attraction 21, on Radio City Playhouse. Somehow I got out of that room. I don't know how, but I did. I got down the stairs and across the street and stumbled into the same dull, dirty little hamburger joint. I sat down in one of the booths. That's where I am now. I'm numb. I'm incapable of any thought. My mind refuses to function in the face of anything so fantastic, so incredibly evil. I've just seen something that no man or woman has ever seen before. And I'm stunned. I'm stunned and horrified. I'm so frightened that when the waitress brings my coffee, I'm not going to be able to speak to her. She's coming now. She thinks something's wrong with me because of yesterday. That's ten cents, lady. Thanks. Say, weren't you in here yesterday afternoon? Say, honey, are you all right? Listen, sister, are you going to faint? Please go away. I'm not going to faint. I... I've got to decide what to do. Yeah? Well, don't do it in here, honey. It began four weeks ago. I was riding in a taxi going north on Fifth Avenue. At 72nd Street, we stopped for a red light pulling up alongside of a Fifth Avenue bus. We waited for a few seconds, and just as the light changed to green, I happened to look up. He was sitting on the bus. We were so close we could have reached out and touched each other. I looked right into his face. Right square smack into his face. There's no possibility that I made a mistake. I was married to him for five years, and I looked directly into his face for at least five seconds. That's a long time. It's one, two, three, four, five. That long. I looked right at him for that long and I slid down the leather seat onto the floor of the cab and fainted. The driver was very kind. Kind, nice-looking boy with a gentle voice. He brought me home. He helped me upstairs to the apartment. Then he went next door and got Grace Henderson to come in and stay with me for a little while. Grace was an old friend. I say was because now she thinks I'm not quite all there. And it's hard for friendship to stand up against that sort of thing. She got me undressed, propped me up on the couch, and poured me a stiff shot of brandy. Grace believes that brandy will cure anything. Drink that, Janet. You'll feel better. Brandy cures anything. Thanks, Grace. You scared the living daylights out of me. Fainting in taxis. What's the matter with you, anyway? Grace, hand me Clinton's picture. What? His picture on the table there. Hand it to me. Why, sure, honey. Sure. 
There. Thanks. You never knew him, did you? Nope. I wish you had. Well, that's war. Yes. It's funny that you know me so well, and yet that you've never known Clint. I don't want to be brutal, Janet, but there's no use brooding over Clint. He's been dead for five years, and it's over, and that's that. He's not dead. I know, honey, and it's fine to think of him that way, I but... saw him in a Fifth Avenue bus this afternoon. <laughs> You what? That's why I fainted. Jen, I took a cab home from shopping. We came to 72nd Street and stopped. We pulled up alongside a bus. I looked up and saw him in the bus. He wasn't more than three feet away from me. I looked right into his face. And then I fainted. Janet, baby, you mustn't talk that way. I know it's been tough getting over Clint. I know you were pretty gone on the guy. But, honey, this isn't healthy. He's been dead for five years, and you've just got to face it. You've got to stop brooding about it. You'll start seeing him at every street corner. That's the way people start going nuts. You just... I saw Janet, him. Janet, stop it. You're behaving like a... Right into his face. Janet, stop it. I did. I saw him. I looked at him for at least five seconds. I'm going to call a doctor. Well, you can call all the doctors you like. I saw him. I was as calm and cool as could be. I wasn't even thinking about him. I'd been shopping and had my hair done. Then I looked up at the bus, and there he was. You can call all the doctors in New York, but there's nothing neurotic or double-visioned or queer about this. Janet, baby, it's so easy to be fooled in things like this. You saw somebody that looked like Clint. And just the way the light fell or something, or the shape of his head, I mean, it's so... He's alive! Janet, the War Department never makes mistakes like that. Never. They sent you his belongings, his letters. You've made a mistake, baby, and it's upset you. He was the strongest man I ever knew. He was so big. He taught me so much. He took me up into the mountains, and in two weeks I was skiing like an expert. He taught me to shoot, to ride. When he was with me, I, I could do anything. Janet, I began to get part of his mind inside mine. He took up painting one time, and four months later he gave a one-man exhibition. More than half the pictures were sold. That's what he's like, Janet. Please, please He used to don't. say that only geniuses were normal. That the rest of us were subnormal. He didn't think that he was unusual. He just thought that he utilized all of his ability. He... He had the most beautiful body I ever saw. On the beach, women and even men would look at him. With all his strength and brilliancy, he was so tender. Honey. So tender. I could pick out his hand from every hand in the world. I know it wasn't any optical illusion, Grace, or mistake. He's alive. And I saw him. I don't know what to say. After five years. What are you going to do? I don't know. Well, you, you could check with the War Department. They wouldn't believe me. No. No, they wouldn't. You don't believe me, do you? I... Yes, honey. But it's just that there's no possible way of explaining Grace, it. Do you know anything about private detectives? How do you find one? Why don't you call, what's his name, your lawyer? Uh, Grange? And you'd better get some rest or you'll break up. You look terrible. <laughs> I called Stuart Grange, my lawyer. He recommended a man named Powell, a private detective company. I made an appointment with Mr. Powell for the next afternoon, and then I tried to get some sleep, but I couldn't. Over and over and over, I asked myself, why? 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 Why would he be alive and in New York and not get in touch with me? Why? There was no answer, no reason. Why would he be alive and let me go on thinking he was dead? That's the first question Mr. Powell would ask me. Why, Why would, would he be he alive and let you go on thinking, thinking he was dead? Why? What reason could there be? I don't know. All right. Could he be ill? I don't know. I mean mentally ill. Perhaps. I don't know. Have you checked with the War Department? No. Five years ago, they sent me his belongings and some letters. He's buried in the military cemetery in Cairo. That's what they said. If I went to see them, they'd... Well, you know how far I get. Have you collected his insurance? Yes, in a lump sum. I also have a war pension. What would he be using for money? I don't know. Did he uh, leave you reasonably well fixed? I mean, would the money be of no interest to him or 
Now, you understand, I'm not trying to pry. Uh, he left I've... me 35000 insurance, about 5000 cash, and the uh, pension. Yeah, it's a very baffling thing. You know, you could have the casket sent Mr. Home. Powell, I'd like to start with the fact that I saw him alive yesterday. Well, then we've got to find a reason. Not yet. We've got to find Clinton first, and then he'll tell me the reason. I, I don't think now, I'll please, be able to... please, please help me. Can you imagine how I feel? I'll pay, pay anything you ask. The fee I... isn't important. It's we've so little to go on. Well, I brought you his picture. Sure, you Mrs. can... Mrs. Wood. We often have missing person cases, but usually not one where there's such incontrovertible proof that the person is dead. The War Department never makes mistakes like this. They'd have every widow and mother and wife in the country raising the very devil. They absolutely never could declare a man dead until they've absolute and final proof. I, I think you've made a mistake, Mrs. Will Wood. you I'm stop sorry. treating me as if I were feeble-minded? I saw him, I tell you. Stop talking to me about the War Department. I saw him. I'm asking you to find him. I'm not asking for psychiatric help. I'm as sane and as sharp-witted as you are. If you oh, can't please, be of any... please, Mrs. Wood, I'm sorry. <laughs> and what makes me so furious? We've got to start with the assumption that he's alive. We can't prove he's alive. We've got to believe he is alive. And then we've got to try to find him. Could there be any sort of secret mission, any reason why the government wishes your husband to be thought dead? I don't know. It doesn't sound very likely. Could he be, uh... Could he be having any sort of affair? You mean a woman? Yes. Well, I suppose he could, but can you imagine a man pretending he's dead just because he's married and wants to live with another woman? Well, he'd come back and ask for a divorce. Yeah, I suppose so. Oh, I've asked myself every possible question as to why there isn't any answer. You've just got to find him. Well, Mrs. Wood, I'll put some men on it at once, and believe me, we'll do the very best we can. Now, go home and write me a list of every place he ever mentioned or ever went to. We'll get busy right away. How long does this sort of thing usually take? Oh, two days, two weeks, maybe two years. Maybe never. I see. We'll keep in touch with you. All right. Uh, Mrs. Wood. Yes? You realize, of course, that if we do find him, there may be something behind his... Well, behind this his strange behavior that will make you wish you'd never tried to find him at all. I'm quite prepared for anything. Anything. For three weeks, I heard nothing. I'd go to bed at nights and it would start. Why, 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 why? Why, over and over? Why should he want me to think he was dead? Why, when we were so in love, so happy, so completely wonderful together? Why would he do this? Then I began to get sick. I couldn't eat. I began to go over our life together, wondering what I could have done that had made Clinton hate me. I exaggerated silly little differences of opinion which we'd had. I began to manufacture terrible non-existent crimes which I'd committed always against Clinton. And then I began to think that perhaps I had made a mistake. It couldn't have happened. He was dead, and I'd seen his double. I began to get a funny, twisting feeling in my legs. I'd be walking around the apartment, and I'd begin to feel as though a nerve was loose in my knees. And then one day, Mr. Powell phoned... to be down there right away. One of my men located him in a cheap walk-up on West 50th Street. He's apparently spending a lot of time in St. Patrick's Cathedral. St. Patrick's Cathedral? Yes, does that surprise you? Yes, it does, rather. But I don't think I'd better wait. Mrs. Till... Wood, wait a minute. Don't go yet. I'm quite sure there's something... Well, something sinister about this. I don't know why, but it's not like any case I've ever had before. I was wondering if you'd like me to go and see him first, then let you know what I'm... No, no, I'll go. Uh, Give me the address. It's written down. Here. Thanks. You've been very kind, Mr. Powell, very understanding. You look very tired. I haven't slept. Try to get calmed down a little before you see him. I'll be all right. 
I'll go in somewhere and have some coffee. I'll be all right. That was yesterday. I came into this frowsy little hamburger place yesterday afternoon. Yesterday, it looked exactly the same way it looks now. And it'll look the same way tomorrow. I came in here because it was right across the street from the address that Mr. Powell had given me. That was yesterday. Less than 24 hours ago. I've got to go over everything very carefully in my mind because I don't dare forget. I don't dare forget anything he said. I came in here yesterday afternoon, about 4 o'clock. The waitress thought I was behaving strangely. I can hear the suspicion in her voice. I asked her for a check, and she said, Why, sure, honey, honey that's, that's five coffees, 50 cents. Listen, dearie, are you sick? Here's a dollar. No, I'm all right. Well, you don't look so good. I'm all right. Uh, keep the chain. Well, thanks, baby. Thanks a lot. And uh, take care of yourself. Where are you going? It's so dirty. So horrible. Dear, dear God. Whatever this is, give me the strength to be... Give me the strength to take it. Please, God. Please. I can't. I can't go on. What would make him hide in this dirty, horrible house? I... <laughs> to be. Oh, there's, there's nobody home. say anything. Just come in. Please don't say anything. Is it... Is it really you? Oh, Janet. Janet. Darling. Darling, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just so long as you're alive, I don't care. I don't want to hear anything. I just want to hold you like this and not care about why or what's happened. As long as you love me, there's nothing, nothing else that matters. Nothing. morning, Clint. Yes. We've got to talk about it now. Yes. You've got to tell me. I know. I'm waiting. Janet. Janet, I can't tell you. Clint, listen. There's absolutely nothing you can't tell me. I'm your wife. I love you. I love you so much that I'd forgive anything. There isn't anything you could have done that I wouldn't forgive. There's no crime, no wickedness, no nothing that I... But you've got to tell me. If we're ever to have any life together again, you've got to tell me why you let me think you were dead for five years. We're... We're not going to have any life together. You're sick. That's it. You're sick. No. Darling, you've been through something. You need rest. Rest and a good food and a good bed and, and me. You need me. No. You know? Well, is, is there some sort of secret mission that you're on? No. That I... Well, has it something to do with the war? No. Yes. Well, then tell me. I can't tell. Darling, please don't torture yourself. Whatever it is, I can take it. I'm not afraid. I'll look after you. I want you to come home with me now, away from this dreadful dark apartment. I'm not going home with you, Janet. You're, you're what? This is my last day here. I may have to leave 
at any minute. Oh, I, I just can't understand anything you say. If I tell say, you, it'll I... be much worse. Well, nothing could be worse than this. Nothing. Not knowing, not knowing what's behind this fantastic, Don't incredible Don't make me thing. tell you. I demand that you tell me. You've got to tell me. Can't you understand that if you go on like this, I'll, I'll go crazy. I lost my mind. Oh, I saw you that day on the bus. I should have left New York and gone away. I knew you'd try to find me. I knew it would be like Stop this. Stop it. Stop I knew it. it would only Stop upset it. you. There's Stop nothing it. in the world. But... Now... Tell me. It, it happened in Cairo. I was on leave, 48-hour pass. A taxi I'd hired for the day ran over an old man. He was a funny, tiny, wizened old man. A beggar, an Egyptian. He didn't seem to be hurt very much. But he was so old that I made him come back to my hotel and lie down for a bit. He was very clean, but so old that his bones were like, like little bits of stick. I made him lie down in my bed for a few minutes. I gave him a sip of wine. Then he closed his eyes for about ten minutes. Then opened them, looked up at me, and, and told me he was dying. He seemed glad. His whole face lit up as though it were the most tremendous relief. He told me not to be worried, not to try to help him, that he was very old and quite ready to die. Then he reached into his clothes and, and handed me this. What is it? It's the holder. The what? The holder. It's a little wheelbarrow made of the finest coal. A tiny little golden wheelbarrow. And the green stone inside it is an emerald. He said it would be of no use to anybody but me. I didn't understand what he meant. He said I'd been picked. Picked? Chosen. I asked him what he meant, but he wouldn't say. He told me the holder brought good luck and bad luck. He said if I held it over my heart and wished that I'd get my wish, then he sort of Breathe once and... I can't, I can't go on. I can't... Janet, please don't make me... Yes, yes, please. Well, in just a few seconds, there was nothing left. Nothing but a thin, fine, silvery powder. He, he just disintegrated in front of my very eyes. To dust. Dry... Fine, gray, dust as old, as old as forever, like Pumas Parra. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I called the manager, but he wouldn't believe that anybody had just died in my bed. There was nothing there. Just half a cup full of dust. Dry, white, dust. And then... I... I went on with my leave. I was a little shaken, so I went out and got drunk. The next night, I reported back to camp. I blurted out the story in the mess one night. I passed the hall around, and everybody wished. Some wished for money, some for girls, some for... Of course, nothing happened. Did you expect something? What? No. Not really. I... I, I don't know. Then what? Then I took it. And wished that you were standing in front of me. Everybody laughed. We knew there was nothing in it. Nobody believed the story. I certainly didn't. I, I felt sort of sheepish. That night, I went to bed. I got the halter out and looked at it again. It sort of fascinated me. I began to imagine all sorts of wishes I could make. I wished that I could be made invisible. That I could move my body from one place to another instantly. Silly... Daydreaming kid stuff. Clinton, please come home. You're not well. You're Let sick. Let me finish. I... Days passed. By January, this was 1943, the advance into Tunisia was stalled. German dive bombers were continuously in action. It was a time of horror and death, and, and all through those terrible days, the feeling gradually came over me that the Halder would, for some time when I was in desperate trouble, that it would help me. This feeling became very strong. I, I can't describe it, but it was very strong. One night, with ten men, I was ambushed in a small mountain pass. 
We knew that it was the end. We knew we would all be killed. It was literally raining death. And I suddenly became terrified. I'd always been nervous in action, but never before I lost control of myself. There were German planes everywhere. I stood up, screamed at them. Screamed at the world. I wish for just one month. I begged for a month. If I have to die, give me a month. Just one month. Any time in five years and ten years. But a month. Give me back a month to see my wife again. <gasps> Clinton, darling, please come home. You're so sick. You're so terribly sick. Janet, you may not believe this. I got my wish. I was instantly killed that night. Instantly killed. Yet I'm here with you, in this room. Don't you understand? I got my wish, and I'm leaving. I've got to leave. Clinton, stop! Where are you going? Janet, get away from that door, please. I don't want you to see this. What, what, Clinton, what is it? My month is up, Janet. I wished for a month back here again. I've had it. I've followed you in the daytime. I've watched you and seen you. But there was no use my coming back into your life. You'd made the adjustment. You were settled. You were happy. I've never been happy without you, never, Clinton. Please, please come on. Janet, I... get away from that door. This is a nightmare. It isn't happening. Janet. Janet, I... Oh. Oh. Clinton. Clinton. Don't do it, Clinton. Wait. No! No! Clinton! Dust. Just. Just thin gray. Silvery. Somehow I got out of that room. Somehow I fought down the hysteria, the terror. I stumbled down the stairs, across the street, back into this horrible little hamburger place. I've got the halter with me. I want to go with Clinton. If it worked for him, perhaps it'll work for me. I'm going to try. I just can't live without him. Oh, our loving Father, God in heaven. If this is a sin, forgive me, please. Please, God, forgive me. But I've got to go with him. I've got to go with Clinton. If I can. Hey, Joe, did that dame that was acting so queer leave without paying her check? Always the fancy dresses that are the cheapskates. Hey, Joe, you deaf? Come here. And bring a rag. There's gray kind of dust stuff all over the floor. You have just heard Strange Identity, an original radio drama written and directed by Harry W. Junkin. Jan Miner starred in the difficult role of Janet Wood. Clinton was Bernard Grant. Other players were Ethel Albert and Lyle Sudrow. The music was composed by Dr. Roy Shield and conducted by Joseph Garner. Radio City Playhouse is supervised for the National Broadcasting Company by Richard P. McDonough. This is Harry Johnson again. Next week, Radio City Playhouse will not be heard. In its place, a special news program called Plans for the New Congress, presented under the auspices of the Democratic National Committee. The week after, Radio City Playhouse will be back as usual, and we very much hope you'll join us. Good night, everybody. NBC, the national broadcasting company.